Thanks so much for inviting me uh, to be a part of this conversation. And certainly I would say this is not my uh, main area of expertise. So I've been listening with um, much interest today and um, fear a little bit that I'm going to be speaking to the choir, but perhaps I'll be speaking from a little bit of a different perspective. Um, I should also note that although I do have the pleasure of working with Dr. McCarthy at the VA, um, that everything I'm going to express today is my views and not that of the VA. Um, so um, I was asked specifically to speak about um, VA clinical practice guidelines and how the VA clinical practice guidelines could inform this conversation. And um, in doing this, I had a chance to go back and look at the VA clinical practice guidelines again. Um, have looked at them many times with a specific focus on screening and evaluation. And I, I want to really highlight, first of all, and I'll say this a number of different times, that I don't believe we're, where we need to be either in terms of more traditional screening and evaluation. Um, there is a lot more work to be done um, in the context of clinical care or more traditional settings uh, and specifically focused on identifying those who are at imminent risk, you know, high risk, intermediate risk, and then how do we intervene? Uh, but to sp talk specifically about the guidelines, just some contextual information, um, there were 22 recommendations. Uh, this was based on all data that was available in 2019. Uh, the strength of the recommendations follows different levels of evidence. And I just want to highlight here that um, the evidence could either be strong or weak. Um, I've said this many, many times, but uh, weak evidence is still really good in terms of a clinical practice guideline. So folks should not be deterred uh, with weak evidence. And in fact, I wish we had more weak evidence. And then the evidence is for or against practic practices. And as I've already um, suggested in many, many cases, uh, sufficient research has yet to be conducted, um, which really, I think, highlights opportunities both to improve uh, more traditional and innovative practices. I, I, I know that uh, most people are probably tracking along with this, but I do think it's really important to, to remind myself and ourselves that, you know, that this hopefully becomes a two-step process or potentially a three-step process or a four-step process where we're screening and really we're screening a larger group of folks um, to detect who may be at risk for suicide and is in need of a further evaluation. And then we would uh, continue on with this smaller group um, and then they would have a, a more comprehensive evaluation um, to inform clinical impressions about acute and chronic risk and then be able to figure out, has been mentioned several times here, uh, based on the level of risk, what would be the appropriate level of care. Um, so in terms of this, uh, there are five recommendations in the CPG related to screening and evaluation. And again, um, these are really based on the evidence, uh, not on personal preference and not even on policymakers preference. So uh, first of all, uh, with regard to universal screening, uh, we suggest using a validated screening tool to identify individuals at risk for suicide related behavior. Uh, that the majority or the, the vast majority of evidence, and this was still not tons of evidence that we were able to find was actually related to the PHQ-9. Now, this is challenging because the PHQ-9 actually is, uh, and the item 9 of PHQ-9 in particular, uh, the item 9 in particular is not... Um, recognized by JCO as best practices. though. So though there is uh, the most evidence for the item nine in terms of the research literature, um, this is not uh, supported by JCO. And you will see that's why in the, in the VA, in terms of our universal screening, we've gone with the Columbia screener. Uh, in terms of ev evaluation, um, this idea of recommending um, assessing for risk factors uh, that include, but are not limited to ideation, prior suicide attempts, current psychiatric conditions or symptoms, prior psychiatric hospitalization, recent stressors, and the availability of firearms. Uh, and that was one of the strongest recommendations that we were able to provide based on the data. Um, it's interesting to think about how each of these or, or these in combination uh, could be identified using more uh, innovative ways uh, in terms of machine learning or algorithms versus asking folks about their history. Uh, certainly in places like the VA, we're very lucky that we're able to often see people's medical records and have access to this information when we're making these uh, evaluations. But certainly not everybody has that. And then how do we really collect this information as part of an evaluation? Um, 
Also, I think importantly, uh, when evaluating risk, we suggest against using a single instrument or method. So this idea that you wouldn't depend solely on a structured clinical interview or solely on a self-report measure or solely on a predictive analytic model, that you would want to collect uh, evidence from multiple sources uh, to make an evaluation. And finally, um, while it's expected that the standard of care is um, risk um, stratification, and I think this is really important because we all do it, I don't know how you would uh, have these discussions if you didn't think about stratification of risk. But to date, uh, at least in 2019, there is very limited evidence in there in the literature regarding risk stratification, how to stratify or how to use stratification to um, facilitate disposition. So based on these recommendations in the VA, we have a two-stage screening process. Um, the screener is the Columbia screener, like I mentioned. And then uh, the evaluation, it includes many of the factors, in fact, all the factors that I discussed that were best practices to inform um, clinical impressions, as I said, risk stratification and disposition. We've created something called the Comprehensive Suicide Risk Evaluation. Now, I think a really key point here, and, and this is certainly a bias of mine because I'm a clinician and I work in a medical setting. Uh, this process is implemented in a clinical setting in which false positives or negatives can be addressed. So this idea that we wouldn't only depend on the screener, we would have lots more information based on the way the patient is presenting, based upon their history, perhaps based upon what their family members are reporting, and that we would be able to use that in addition to the screener and then be able to complete the evaluation. So as has been mentioned already today, I think it becomes much more challenging when we're trying to make these kinds of assessments without augmented information. Um, however, I think there's some really important questions that have been brought up today in relation to this discussion. Um, so what if there are groups of individuals who are more willing to communicate emotional distress online than to adults or healthcare providers? And as we've heard today and has been supported in the literature, there is a group of adolescents and I'm guessing a group of military members and probably a group of adults who would much rather um, communicate distress online than to another individual. Uh, what if providers don't see patient enough to ask about suicide at the most important time? So even though we're doing universal screening, which I think is a step ahead, and we have shown already that we're able to connect individuals to care, um, we may be asking at the wrong time or during the wrong visit. You know, somebody could come in early in the year and be very, very um, good and things are going well and then have some very large stressors happen. And actually the appropriate time to screen them would be at, you know, in the fall. Um, what if providers don't feel comfortable asking about suicide? I would tell you this is a huge issue. Um, I think we've made great gains in terms of mental health in this area. And I also think we have started to make some really wonderful gains in terms of primary care and even specialty care in the VA. What I often try to think about is this idea of screening for depression. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, the idea of screening for depression in primary care also seemed um, strange and out of scope, and it made people feel very uncomfortable. I think um, we've come a huge way in terms of screening for depression, um, and I think we are getting there, and we're really being able to kind of show that in the VA, even in clinics, and I was looking at my email earlier today, we are having had a series of emails today to the risk ID um, helpline uh, about screening in dental clinics and trying to figure out the best ways to screen for individuals who are coming in for their dental checkups, which is super encouraging to me because it's starting to um, feel like perhaps suicide prevention can be everybody's business if, if we are um, breaking down stigma. But still, I don't think we're there with all providers feeling comfortable. And then I think also importantly, uh, what if our screening or evaluation tools are neither sensitive nor specific enough to identify risk? And I think we've shown again and again that uh, the tools that we all love, the tools that we use, um, they are highly limited and really suggest to me that we need to find uh, combinations of innovative ways to really evaluate risk. Um, I know this uh, study has been talked about already today and um, and I do think it's a wonderful study, and I read it again before um, this talk, and I know that this exact picture has already been shown today, but, 
you know, really highlighting this, this idea that like somebody really is on social media and may post to social media all the time. And we may have very limited um, opportunities in terms of healthcare interactions. Um, because this isn't my area of specialty, I, I did a little bit of um, sleuthing and just, it wasn't hard to find. I mean, these, these policies are posted all over the place. And, and I think it's very kind of interesting to go look about how, um, and I'm not trying to pick on any one company. I think that actually I really appreciated that Facebook's policies were, were right posted and they did try, you know, if you looked, it, they did suggest what they did. Um, as I'll highlight later um, in terms of kind of ethical considerations and has already been brought up in terms of privacy, I'm not sure all of us do due diligence and looking at uh, policies and rationales before we use uh, social media. So this idea that um, wanting Facebook to be a safe place and that really wanting to um, consult with experts to find a way um, to um, help keep the safe, the Facebook, in this case, community safe. Um, and then this idea, again, had, that has also been brought up, um, you know, what will happen potentially if somebody is expressing concerns and this history that, that Facebook has been doing this for more than 10 years um, and that they do provide resources. At, and here they also do highlight that they use artificial intelligence to prioritize the order in which their, their teams reviews posts and videos and live streams, and that that also does impact in terms of how, how they outreach, and that in serious cases, um, they do um, contact emergency services. So as was just said, you know, not necessarily contacting the crisis line, but contacting emergency services. And the factors that they highlighted were a time method and intent. Um, I did look to see if I could find more because I always like more information, but that was what I could really find about, you know, their algorithm and how they're making these decisions. I think, uh, you know, time method and intent are consistent with what we look for in clinical practice. However, um, you know, probably not sufficient in, in many, many cases. And I think what we have and what we consistently find in clinical care is we have folks that are, you know, at very imminent risk. And um, there's not a lot of confusion about how the kind of care that they need or how to help them get that care. But then there's this very, very large middle and it's that middle, the intermediate risk, or even, you know, that where's the line between high risk and intermediate risk that we are challenged to figure out how to provide um, most autonomy to individuals, most uh, ability to choose uh, patient-centered choices and shared decisions around, um, you know, inpatient versus outpatient care. And so I, I think these things become very challenging. As we've also discussed, um, has also been discussed today, um, you know, that we are getting better at better at having emergency services reach people. Uh, we are looking at novel and innovative ways across the country um, to have these interactions um, where, you know, maybe it's uh, police safety officers, maybe it's mental health and safety officers together. Maybe it's a, a wide range of, of individuals that can then have a more maybe nuanced discussion about the kind of care that individuals need or would prefer. So again, back to this article, I know this has also been shown today, um, but I really think it's important, this idea that, you know, even in uh, very good circumstances, and this is true with traditional practice in clinical settings, we are going to have false and positives and false negatives. Um, the other thing that I think is really important that they were able to show in this paper is that um, they were really able to identify more um, trait like um, information versus state-like information. And this is a consistent problem for, for us in the field of suicide prevention. Um, there are folks who are consistently at some level of risk. And in the VA, we like to talk about acute risk and chronic risk. But how do we determine if somebody is in acute risk or chronic risk? How do we then uh, determine the level of risk? And then how do we determine whether something has changed or not that would require a different level of care? And ideally, um, you know, that, that we would be able to kind of track individuals flowing uh, between these levels and also between acute and chronic. We have a very challenging time doing that in a valid and reliable way 
um, as human beings, as clinicians. Um, and I, and I'm guessing that also th that we are challenged in terms of doing that with more innovative ways too. So, you know, I think it presents, you know, challenges for us across the board in, um, what do we do when we think there is risk? How do we facilitate, um, the disposition, um, based upon preferences and, um, I know that this has also been discussed today, but this idea that, you know, not all interventions are perceived as helpful or are actually helpful. Um, I think we've come a long way in terms of thinking about how can we help people keep safe, not in a psychiatric hospitalized uh, setting? How do we help people maintain their autonomy, uh, receive intensive outpatient care, implement strategies like safety planning? Um, and those conversations really at that line between perhaps intermediate acute risk and high acute risk are challenging. And um, I'm not sure that the nuance of that can actually be figured out using an algorithm, uh, particularly if you're using an algorithm to make a, a 911 or a 988 decision. Finally, uh, we know that um, there are differences, and I think very, very important differences between how cohorts use social media and how should that um, difference be incorporated into algorithms. Uh, we run into these same challenges in the VA with our predictive modeling um, and this idea that perhaps if the majority cohort is, um, let's say, male in this case and veteran, do our predictive models work equally well for women? Um, and so how are these algorithms um, appreciating individual difference, whether that's for individuals that are older and younger, whether there's differences in geographic location, there's been work that's shown that um, individuals at different geographic locations post differently about suicidal behavior. How does race, ethnicity, cultural background, uh, primary language, how does that not only impact what people post, but then how does it impact the algorithms that we use to um, assess risk level? And then finally, what are the implications of intervening based on limited data? Uh, this is a very nice article, really encourage folks to take a look at it. Um, at, in terms of legal and ethical and wider implications of suicide risk detection in social media platforms. And certainly this idea of consent, when you um, get on a social media platform, do you understand um, that what's going to happen with your data? Um, are we respecting privacy and autonomy? And then again, are we able to evaluate patient preferences in terms of an intervention strategy? Uh, the other piece that has been mentioned today, um, but I think is also interesting is like, would there be a way, let's say, to use this data on uh, social media platforms, but then um, provide that data to providers? So in the VA, we're really fortunate to be able to have a great relationship with the lifeline and have a veteran specific hot crisis line and chat line where we do have additional information and we do have individuals that we know are at risk. And could we then have combinations that would actually be more patient centered and would provide more data so that we could be sure about the imminence of risk and the need for more emergency services. Uh, finally, I wanted to pull, and if, if you're a researcher on this call or uh, interested in uh, some areas that I think are really important, uh, these were knowledge gaps and recommended research areas that are in the back of the CPG. And there were a number of research areas um, related to screening for suicide risk. And I think many of them apply to this more innovative platform as well as traditional platforms. So this idea of assessing and improving temporal accuracy of screening and assessment tools, as was highlighted in, in the Cooper Smith article, the state versus trait. And we are not so great at state, um, both in, in all different settings. Um, how do we identify acute versus chronic risk? Um, our, you know, we need more work to show that our stratification that we do in, in every clinical um, interaction actually is reliable and valid. Um, how often should we be screening people? Um, you know, is what's happening in clinical settings during universal screening or even um, selected screening for those in mental health settings, is that too little, but is social media too much? And in terms of evaluation, really determining to um, what extent, you know, should we have this connection between 
uh, screening and evaluation? Are we really getting the right people in there? Um, and what really is the most appropriate setting to do these evaluations in? And then again, this idea of connecting risk levels to most appropriate care settings, whether that's inpatient, outpatient, or intensive. Uh, I think these are all challenging questions. Um, we certainly are struggling with them um, in terms of the clinical care that we're providing. And I always like to hi highlight the Myrick a consult service. So this is a consult service that's available to any provider that's working with veterans. Um, and I think this idea of kind of you know, if things are not imminent, having other people to discuss uh, social media posts and um, content that you might find in the medical, medical record and content that you um, might get from the patient and how to, to reconcile these things and how to incorporate lots of different kinds of data. I know the team has worked with a number of different providers about these challenges. And so uh, invite folks to uh, reach out to the team to consult. And with that, I thank you.